Hey everybody, this is Jerry. So I've been doing interviews recently and today I have a very special guest. His name is Dick Klein and he's one of the inventors of the Klein Fogelman airfoil. It's a radical different way of thinking of aerodynamics and you guys can search it up on Wikipedia once you're done watching this video. I can put a link also in the description. But um, he reached out to me on um, YouTube and he had a bunch of very interesting ideas. So I wanted to discuss life with him. So welcome to the show, Mr. Klein. Thank you, Jerry, and call me Dick. Basically, when I looked at the clip that you showed of uh, the uh, pickup in, in the uh, the bar, the blonde at the bar. That's right. Um, I thought to myself, oh my gosh, um, this is all nice game theory and everything, but it is so removed from the reality that I know about. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that uh, is, first of all, I'm not a psychotherapist, okay? Mm -hmm. But I have a very strong interest in programming and conditioning. And it all came about because I, I was married for 14 years when, when the marriage fell apart. It started going south after 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I was devastated. I, you know, because I thought I was married forever. Two young kids, and she found somebody else, and, and a lawyer tells me I gotta leave the house, and that's it, you wow. know? A goodbye and good luck, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I'm completely destroyed emotionally, you know, like wrecked. And someone said to me that there was a connection between the woman I married and my mother. Oh. And when I, when I heard that, I said, no freaking way. Let me tell you how wrong you are. The woman I married is completely the opposite of my mother. I, 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 there wasn't anything I could see that would remind me of my mother and this woman. And you know, we've all heard the story, you marry your mother, you marry your father. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Freud. Well, let, let me tell you, Pavlov, was right. Pavlov, huh? Very interesting. Well, well, I mean, uh, in terms of conditioning, we are all creatures of conditioning, and there is very little free choice. Mm -hmm. It's all based on prior input. And uh, <clears throat> at the time, I knew none of this. None mm -hmm. of it. And so I, I was like Moses in the desert. What the hell am I looking for? What is this link between my mother and the woman I married? I, it can't be, it can't be. You know? <laughs> so my argument was my uh, ex-wife was beautiful, intelligent, talented, creative, had savoir faire, give her a plus. My mother was whining and sniveling and complaining and blue and depressed and a very uh, a, a victimized woman. Sounds like my mother. So, huh? Sounds like my mother. Okay, well, <laughs> then we're, we, we, Jerry, we are on the right track <laughs> for your uh, <laughs> breakthrough. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I, I look at these two women, they don't look anything alike, act anything alike, talk anything alike, dress anything alike. They literally had nothing in common that I could see. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I'm struggling with this and I'm spending about a year what the hell am I looking for? What does it look like? And worst of all, if I find it, how, 
how am I going to know? There's nobody to tell me, hey, congratulations, you found it. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how the hell I did it, except I believe that when you plant a seed into your brain, subconsciously it goes to work. Mm -hmm. And when you least expect it, something suddenly bubbles to the surface. Mm -hmm. And what bubbled to the surface was the answer, the connection, the link between the woman I married and my mother. And I thought to myself, oh my God, if I hadn't found this, I'd have made the same mistake all over again, just like a homing pigeon. Mm -hmm. Because that was my programming. Of course. And here's, and here's what it was. And by the way, what I'm going to describe to you is one of the largest patterns out there for both men and for women. And I call it the savior syndrome. And for men also, I refer to it as the damsel in distress syndrome. Mm -hmm. How many stories have been uh, illustrated of, I'll save you, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's how it plays out. When you're little and there's mommy, and she is miserable and unhappy and and daddy is mean to her or whatever but but you because she's your first love connection outside of yourself this is the first powerful emotional uh, uh, love connection in your life you want to save her but you can't save her you're a little kid you can't help her so when you grow up guess what you do you gravitate to women in pain looking for someone you can save and thus redeem yourself because you couldn't save mommy now women do the same damn thing uh, let's say a woman who always picks out an ex-alcoholic an ex-drug addict, an ex-convict, somebody she can save. And, well, if I just love him, he'll be forever grateful. No, he won't. <laughs> <laughs> so, in a sense, there's your pattern, too. You have been gravitating to women who are needing to be saved because you couldn't save mommy. How does that sound? I think that's absolutely brilliant. Every girl I've had a crush on, every girl um, I've dated has had something wrong with her. Seriously, every girl I've dated, every girl I've had a crush on, um, it's almost like a sixth sense. I could sense that she had something, like some sort of emotional trauma and then that made me want to get to know her. It's so fucked up. Right. Right. Well, here's the thing. Um, I, I've written a list, which I, I should get your email address, and I will send you. This, this is the most daunting list you will ever look at. It's a list of all the various aspects of what a relationship is comprised of, okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I've, I've got a lot of theories, okay? But one of them is, and, and I think this is the thing, you can take this to the bank, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the top one on the list is level of self-esteem and self-worth. Mm -hmm. We are always drawn to people who have the same level of self-esteem and self-worth 
that we have. So if you're a two, guess what? You're going to pick another two. You will not pick a ten. You will talk yourself out of it. What the hell would they want with me? You're going to feel outgunned. They, they're too secure. You're going to find a wounded bird who's on your level. Okay. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, what does one do? The first thing that you have to do is raise your level of self-esteem and self-worth. The higher you raise it, the higher you will pick from. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, what happened in my case was once I saw this link, and who the hell elected me the savior of somebody else? I have enough trouble saving my own ass. I gotta go find someone else I can save. <laughs> you know, what am I, nuts? <laughs> <laughs> so I raised my level of self-esteem and self-worth, and then I picked from a different level, a higher level. Mm -hmm. And I, I found a woman. I have been in heaven with this woman for 43 years. Wow. And it has been heaven on earth. Uh, she, I, I, I tell her every day how much I love her, and I really, really do. My life is like, I, I couldn't ask for more, because for all of us, uh, we want to connect with somebody. And, uh, you know, this uh, business of going it alone or, or not having a relationship, a healthy relationship. People who live alone get sick more often and die a lot younger. People who have relationships that are healthy and positive and loving and supportive live a much healthier life, okay? And that is the, the trick to pull off, to, to, to find someone that you're simpatico with, who, uh, again, uh, I, I, I will have to send you this list of things because there's a lot to look at in a relationship. But I would say the first thing to recognize is that for all of us, much of our existence, our consciousness is, is grounded in fantasy, not reality. And that's now going back to um, the, the uh, blonde in the bar. Okay, you see, he, he sees this woman that's like, wow, I would like to get to know her. Nobody has any idea what that entails. This woman could have been sexually molested as a child and has enormous problems, could be bipolar, could be uh, uh, an addicted to a number of things, could be a mess. <laughs> but here you are saying, I want that. <laughs> yep. You know, that's fantasy land. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know? So where is reality and what good is all this game theory when it, it's not even getting in the door of reality? You know, it could even be as crazy as it sounds. She doesn't smell right or, or she has a laugh that you find putting, put off. Uh, you know, it, it, it could be any number of things. You know, or 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 she uh, thinks what you think is funny is stupid. <laughs> you know, uh, it could be any number of things, and poof, there goes the fantasy. You know, it has it's not grounded in any reality. You know, the trick is to is to uh, evaluate the person and not be taken in by this illusion that you've created in your mind does this make sense what I'm saying 
Yeah, absolutely. And the thing, the thing is, when we have a crush on someone, we tend to just project a lot of our fantasies on the person. It's just like we're not thinking clearly because the mind is tricking itself. It's literally on sort of heroin, like the mind's version of heroin. Right. Right. Exactly. And and it's uh, but but the more you arm yourself with what you really should be evaluating the better position you're in to make a better choice but you gotta know what the hell you're looking at and that that's why i want to send you this list because there are a lot of tough things on that list (laughs) you know but it's not impossible it's just uh, and, and again, part of it too, as I said, is, is uh, gravitating to to people who are intelligent and grounded and and have a, a good sense of themselves. But you, you, you at this up to this point in time, and I was doing the same thing, which is why that pattern is so big. If you're out there looking to save somebody. And you also have to take a look at that, too. You're looking for some leverage. Hey, if I save her, she'll be forever grateful. The answer is, no, she won't. (laughs) (laughs) If anything, she'll just want to take advantage of you even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so, uh, you know, it's like uh, women who pick uh, abusive men. Well, I just have to love him more. It's like that guy who got hit over the head with a bottle. Yep, that story. Thanks for watching that story, by the way. Oh, well, yeah, I watched a bunch of them, you know, and, and uh, you know, because I wanted to uh, see, you know, what you explored and so forth. And uh, the thing is that, uh, I mean, I could go on and on with other programming stories. Um, uh, that uh, well, all right. I'll I'll do one one more, which was again a, a large pattern emerged out of it. Oh, let me interrupt myself with one thing. Now here is the crazy part: the guy who told me about the connection between the mother and and my my uh, ex wife was also heavily into therapy, okay? Mm -hmm. And I learned years later because he was the guy who ran off with my ex. Whoa. (laughs) Yeah, whoa is right. But he did me a huge favor. He did Mm -hmm. me a huge favor, and she did too. You know, because very often negative things turn out to be positive they have much to teach you and when you look back over your shoulder you say you know I wouldn't change a note I learned so much from that Mm -hmm. you know but at the moment you're going through it it's like the end of the world right Mm -hmm. but anyway what I was going to tell you was this guy I had a chance to quiz him on what his connection was between his mother and his first wife. Mm -hmm. And what he told me didn't add up. And I was shocked. He never found the answer himself. (laughs) And that blew me away. Mm -hmm. But I had made the assumption that, hey, if he told me about it, he's got to know, right? wrong (laughs) wow Wow. yeah yeah so who told him then uh well the therapist told him but he he didn't get it he didn't pick up on it he was a very controlling person and uh, let me put it this way you know uh, woody allen's been in therapy for 30 years or whatever there's a reason why it doesn't ever resolve itself because um If you go into therapy, you have to be willing to invalidate yourself. True. You're a screw up. 
not the world has to change you have to change yep and many people are not willing to do that it's easier to blame everybody else but not to put the blame and the responsibility and the decision to make the choices that you did on yourself okay mm-hmm. so that's how that plays out for, for a lot of people but at any rate um, someone might say well Dick you know that that's you that's not everybody well I have some programming codes that I discovered from the female point of view which I also found really fascinating uh, and I made a, a discovery of a huge pattern that exists because of it. So now the first pattern is the, the savior syndrome. Both men and women to a very large degree have this pattern, mm-hmm. okay? Okay, so now there's another pattern I uncovered and it, co- it plays out like this. I was working with this woman, uh, she was a writer. I was the art director on this assignment, and she says, "Let's go to lunch." And I, okay, fine, we'll go to lunch. And she starts going on and on about her uh, pending divorce and bitter custody battle over her child and and the whole mess, you know. And um, I said to her. Uh, well, look, uh, I think what you have to do is take a look at all of your male relationships and try to find a common denominator, something that links them all together. And she looked at me and said, don't be ridiculous. I've done 20 years of therapy. I've done est. Uh, what do you know? <laughs> I said, hey, listen have nothing to lose by trying what I'm suggesting. Yeah. Okay, I'll try. I see her the next day. Dick, you were right. I found a link. Well, I'm doing handsprings in my head because I'm thinking, holy shit, I get to see what another programming code looks like because the only one I knew was my own and and also to, to, to see what it's like from the female point of view. Yeah. Yeah. So I said to her, Well what 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 did you find? And she said, Well, every guy I ever went out with lived a long distance away. Like she'd go on a cruise, meet a guy, fall in love, the long distance letters, the long distance phone calls then they get together and turn the shit (laughs) (laughs) on to the next one right so I said to her okay I said well where was daddy when you were a little girl and she said ah he was in the army and I missed him so and I used to say to my mother when's he coming home she grows up trying to complete a long distance relationship. And oh my God, there it is. But that's half the story. Here, here's the second half with the big payout for mm-hmm. me. Okay, I see her six months later. Hey, how's it going? Oh, terrific, she says. I'm seeing someone who lives close by, no long distance phone calls, no long letters. Um, I have a problem though, maybe you could help me with it. I said, well, what's the problem? She said, well, the man I'm seeing is a surgeon. He's living at home with his wife. They're working out custody over the kids. My problem is he's a very angry man. He's angry with his wife. He's angry with his fellow doctors because he was part of a clinic. And do you think I should keep seeing him? I said, well, 
first of all, that's totally your decision. It's, it's not for me to tell you whether you should see them or not. That's up to you. However, I would point out that the uh, anger toward other people is part of his M.O. And sooner or later, he will direct that anger toward you. Exactly. And I say, you want to play a little game? Oh, okay. All right, here's what I want you to do. Picture yourself as a little girl about eight years old, and there's mommy, and there's daddy, and mommy is making daddy very unhappy. And you say to yourself, oh, daddy, come with me and I'll make you happy. And she says, oh, no, that's been another one of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to myself, holy shit, I have just tripped over a huge matrix. And this is the matrix. Out in the world, right now, today, there are thousands and thousands of women always getting involved with an unhappily married man saying, oh, I'll make you happy. Conversely, you've got thousands and thousands of men out in this world always getting involved with an unhappily married woman saying, he did what to you? That son of a bitch, I'm gonna kill him. You know, because when that guy was little, his dad was mean to his mother, and now he's gonna find a substitute he can save. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And it plays out over and over and over again, and people are totally clueless. They have no idea what's pulling the strings. None whatsoever. So, that was the, the second big discovery I made. Um, and, and I went on to, in a whole other area, I went on to make another mind-blowing discovery. And this is in, in a completely different area uh, uh, other than relationship, but it's, it, I think, very critical and very important to grasp, to, to understand it. Uh, it, it plays out like this. Anybody who puts themselves in harm's way is doing so to fill a need. And, and this is a basic premise. Nobody does anything unless it fills a need. Otherwise, why do it? So that there's always a motive, a hidden motive behind any um, action that people take. Say, for example, bungee jumping, skydiving, mountain climbing, swimming with sharks, uh, stunt car racing, whatever. Okay, anybody who puts themselves in harm's way, and the poster boy for this is Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. That's oh, right, Mike. This bait. Poisonous spider almost got me. Well, <laughs> beautiful creature. Oh, what a beauty. <laughs> <laughs> right. So one day the stingray says, get the hell away from me, zap. <laughs> and it's over. <laughs> you know. Okay. What's, all, what's behind all that? It goes like this. When you are little and you are menaced in some way where you feel your life is threatened, what you have to do when you grow up, and it's very hard to get off the hook. Uh, I had the problem, but I did get off the hook. What you have to do is set the danger up to prove to yourself that you can 
conquer it. And you never get off of it. You've got to keep doing it and always setting the bar a little higher. <laughs> yeah. Until one day, splat. Yep. <laughs> okay? And yet people are totally clueless that they're being run by a program, a conditioning that they have had with them since their childhood. Okay? Now, my particular, now, how, how, do, how did I learn all this? Okay? I mean, it doesn't come out of the blue. It's connected to something you personally experienced. And just to divert for a minute, uh, the only way you get to own information and the reason for wanting to own it is so that you can employ it on your behalf, okay? But you can't get it from a lecture, you can't get it from a book, you can't get it from watching a movie, you can't get it any other way other than experiencing something. That's when it becomes real. Say, for example, how to make a million in the stock market in six weeks. Lots of luck. There's no way you're going to make a million dollars in six weeks. Now, the guy who wrote the book did it, but highly unlikely he could repeat it. Uh -huh. The conditions are always changing. Yeah. But, but the point being that uh, you, you uh, cannot get information uh, out of uh, a, a story or, I mean, you can get it to some degree, but you don't really own it. It's not part of you the way it's part of you when you own the experience. See, because it, then it's, it's in your fibers, you know, and, and you can use it. You, you, you understand the concepts behind it, okay? Mm -hmm. So, at any rate, now, to go back to the uh, death threat that was laid on me when I was little, and to show you how it all played out, um, when I was um, going through my divorce, uh, my, my, my first wife and I were finishing up breakfast and we were going to go into the city and pick up our kids who were returning from uh, a summer camp in Pennsylvania, bring them home, sit them down and tell them that we were divorcing and that this was the end of the family. So it was a very, very painful day for me and I was very, very vulnerable at that mm -hmm. And she's around the corner in the breakfast nook talking about her childhood, okay? I'm standing in front of the refrigerator door and all of a sudden a movie appears. It's in my head, but you know, I'm seeing it on the refrigerator door of me a little five-year-old kid, and my mother is saying to me, oh, Dickie, I'm so blue, I'm so depressed. I feel like taking you and your brother down to the lake, and we all jump in. And I experienced an emotional implosion inside of a, a, a feeling of helplessness that I couldn't save myself. And that panic, stayed with me all the way into adulthood. It would only show up at certain times, let's say if I misplaced my wallet or my car keys, it was like <laughs> you know, utter panic. But worse than that, I put my life at risk. I, I, I lived in Connecticut as a young man, and my buddies and I would go to a lake, Bark Hampstead in Connecticut, I'd say, I'll see you guys later. I would pick a point out on the far shore of the lake and I would swim to it and back with no lifeguards, no rowboats, nothing. If I get a cramp, I'm a goner, but I tell myself, oh, I love to swim and I can do this. <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. uh, but, you know, and I don't know how many times I did it, but I was putting my life at risk, okay? Mm -hmm. I'd go to the seashore 
sure. I'd wear a frog's mask and frog's feet. I'd be under the surface, holding my breath more than on the surface. Wow. Wow. What service did I join? I joined the Navy. They're all connected. Mm -hmm. So much for free choice. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so the thing is, once I saw this movie in my head, flashing on the refrigerator door, it was, the penny dropped. It was like, oh my God. So that's why I've been swimming lakes Mm -hmm. all these years, okay? And I cried for myself, that little kid who felt so panicked, so helpless, and it was a horrible feeling that I couldn't shake. I didn't know how it got there, I didn't know how to get rid of it, but it was always there, right? Mm -hmm. And um, what happened was I would keep bringing the experience back again and again and again, and every time I did, I felt it less and less and less until poof, it was gone. And guess what happened? I stopped swimming lakes. Wow. It was, it was over. I, I broke free of that programming code. And um, uh, that's why I, I feel so convinced that that it's very, very important to connect your emotional dots. Another way to uh, 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 look at this too is that there are a lot of people uh, who have misplaced anger and uh, you know they'll chew out uh, somebody uh, on the highway or whatever you know but it's all misplaced anger because that anger emanates from some childhood injustice that now is permeates and comes out uh, on a substitute. <laughs> you know, it's misplaced. But but they're clueless. They have no idea. Somebody might beat the shit out of somebody, but they're trying to beat the shit out of their father, maybe, except they've transferred the anger onto a, a, a symbol. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Somebody who, who got them riled up, you know. And uh, that's how uh, scary the whole thing is in terms of, is there really any free choice? It, it, it's, it all seems to be based on what your prior input is, Mm -hmm. or or a lot of it, you know, and so the trick is find ways to connect the dots, Uh, pay attention, and especially when you're vulnerable or angry, what does it remind you of? And all of a sudden, something may bubble to the surface, and you, you say, aha, that's where it comes from, you know, now you're in a position deal with it and not let it just blindly run you. Mm-hmm. So, does it make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, it's very yeah. deep. And, you know, I'm just thinking back to my life and how, you know, sometimes um, one of my, one of the things as a kid, right, my dad sometimes would beat my mom. And I remember reaching out to family friends and I'd be telling them, I'd be saying something like, yeah, you know, um, my, 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 my dad beats my mom. And then one, one lady, like she was the wife of a friend of my dad, like, you know, heard me and like, she tried to give me advice as to, you know, what, what can you do? And like, she really didn't give me good advice, but at least she tried. She's like, well, next time, just like uh, drag your mom into another room and be like, okay, um, we're going to we're gonna leave dad alone or something like that. So she tried very hard to give me advice. And one time, um, like 
um, she even called me to make sure I was okay. So this like this wife of my dad's friend tried to give me advice, but in the end, it's like I still couldn't do anything. I couldn't stop my dad from hitting my mom. And so you know, I'm thinking about stuff like this, and it just it's like this definitely leaves a mark. No matter how strong, how much of a male you are, it leaves a mark on you. And it definitely has affected um, sort of like anything. Whenever I see domestic violence, whenever I see a parent hit his or her kid, I want to just like hurt the parent. You know, it's just, it's just like that. Triggers. Yeah, triggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what the only thing I could advise you to do is to place yourself back there in that time frame and allow yourself to feel what you felt mm -hmm. and then do it again and do it again and even cry for yourself or cry for your mother but allow the release of those pent up feelings that are really trapped inside Mm -hmm. And what you will find is you cannot keep going back to it without releasing it. It just has to diminish. Because mm -hmm. you just can't hold it in place unless you choose to hold it in place. Yeah. But the object, the object is to uh, try to release it out into the world and get free of it. Yeah, it, it's the greatest freedom in the world because you're freeing yourself from the slavery of programming that you had no part in. You were you were just there to be, you know, uh, imprinted, if you will. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, uh, you know, it, it, it should help. It really should help you. Yeah, I it's I totally see the logic behind this, and what I liken it to is when someone has a phobia. Let's say they're really afraid of spiders, or you know, tryptophobia is one that a lot of humans have but don't know. Tryptophobia is when you're afraid of things that have a lot of holes because evolutionarily, things with a lot of holes meant it was rotten or it was poisonous. But now it's like you know, if you, there's a design that has a lot of holes, it gets people all like scared. Or if you see some, if you see a drawing with a lot of eyes or something, it's only scares people but like you know the way to get past the phobia is gradual desensitization maybe for a week you think about it the next week maybe you look at it for two seconds the next week maybe you look at it for five seconds so you know it's proven that that desensitization process gets you slowly and slowly less afraid and you can apply this to sort of traumatic um what they call in psychology flashbulb memories you you can't hold it in place because that's not healthy, but you also can't flood yourself because then you might damage yourself for a few months. So you have to gradually put yourself in there, kind of like how you used to swim in the lake and then you used to do, you know, join the Navy. It's like you have to gradually put yourself until you're ready to completely face it and then you let it all out and then you'll, you'd be surprised. You're not scared of it anymore. You're not, you're not affected by it anymore. My best story I could tell is I used to be really afraid of spiders. Um, and you know, I would see a spider sometimes and I'd like yell, but one time AP biology class, thank you, Miss Tierney, by the way, if you ever see this AP biology class in high school, she brought in the molted shell of her tarantula. She had a pet tarantula. So the molted shell is basically the tarantula, but not living because it's like the shell that it was growing in. Right. And I, I saw it. And then after a few minutes, I even touched the shell. But because it wasn't a real spider, it was the last shell of the spider, that gradual desensitization got me to the point where now I'm not afraid of spiders anymore. Yes, yeah. And so yeah. your advice is so good because it's like you have to go face these bad memories, but you have to do it in a very smart way. And it's like, okay, yeah. step back slowly, try to feel what it is, and it's like, it's it's like it's I really like what you're doing and when you were telling me about that I did kind of look back on it and even me telling you those stories I was just like I was like I was feeling it a little and then it made me feel better
Yeah. So tell me about sort of your process after you got divorced. How did you meet your sort of soulmate or this woman you've been with for 40 something years? Well, well, actually, I was in the process of uh, going through the divorce. Uh, and uh, she uh, and I met at the same train station. And uh, we started out being uh, friends at first, you know, just riding in the train together. And, um, and then we met for lunch and everything. And I, I, I found her to be just a, a wonderful human being. And, um, and, and, you know, I was telling her about what I was going through and so forth. And, you know, gradually we, we got to the point where we realized that we really enjoyed being together, and uh, and then uh, when I left uh, the, the house that I was in, uh, the two of us moved into an apartment together. For, and we were in the apartment for three years uh, before we bought a house together and got married. And um, uh, you know, see. Uh, what I wanted to also indicate uh, to you was that, um, you know, again, people who live alone get sick a lot more often and die younger. You know, people who are in a good relationship remain healthy for a lot longer and fulfilled, you know, because they, they complete a connection with another human being. But it's, it's also being able to express love and have that love return to, to, to know that you're with someone who's got your back covered and you've got their back covered. Uh, someone who cares about you as you care about them. And I let her know all the time how much I appreciate what she's done for my life. Uh, and that makes me feel good being able to express it. So there's a, there's a, a sense of uh, completeness inside and, and uh, happiness that, that's very hard to describe, but it's like, boy, I, I'm so <laughs> in love with her. So, um, this invention, sort of this product you, you helped create, was this before you got married the first time, during your marriage, or was it th it, after your... It was, uh, during, it was during, uh, it actually, it took place in, um, uh, where, when I first started on it, it was 1964, okay? Nice. And I was in the uh, Salmon Building on the 24th floor, 42nd Street, New York City, Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And I had a view of Bryant Park and the, and the uh, uh, New York Public Library. Oh, I miss New York so much hearing you say that. I love New York. <laughs> yeah, it, it's got an electricity to it. It's unbeatable. Mm -hmm. And I used to fly my paper airplanes out over the city, trying try to land them in Bryant Park. Nice. <laughs> and uh, it was uh, during that period that, um, well, l let me just back up a little bit. Um, I started making paper airplanes in my office with this writer and um, then uh, I, I wanted to make a paper airplane that I could throw outside with my, my son at home on weekends, you know, or, or when I, whenever we'd go to the park. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, I visualized in my mind, and, and this is a very important aspect, uh, in fact, when you give me your email address, I will send you a visual 
an, a, a piece of artwork I did of Einstein riding a beam of light. Wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And there's copy underneath it that I wrote, uh, and it was all to inspire people. Here's the thing. When you pose a question to your brain, you set in motion the wheels that lead to a solution. And um, the, the, what, what Einstein did was he asked himself a question, what's it like to ride a beam of light? By picturing it, he imagined himself on this beam of light and then turning around, looking over his shoulder and seeing a Big Ben clock with the hands at midnight. And that gave him the clue that traveling at the speed of light, time ceases to exist. And that's when he wrote his theory of relativity, which turned the world on its ear. Yeah. So I did this illustration of that, which I'll send to you. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but a second one uh, I'm going to run by you is Nikolai Tesla. I love that guy. He was a Serbian who, uh, at 11 years old, his father, oh no, his uncle, his uncle was showing him a picture book. And they're flipping through the pages of the book, uh, big pictures of all the great scenes in the world, right? And all of a sudden, the uncle flips the page, and there's a double page spread of Niagara Falls. And Nikolai Tesla says, Uncle, Uncle, someday I'm going to electrify Niagara Falls. This is at 11 years old. Wow. In his mind, he could see turbines generating power from the falling water. Ripple dissolve. Years later, there he is with George Westinghouse, they're installing turbines to generate power at Niagara Falls. But it started in his mind and visualizing it. Okay, now, in my case, I wanted to make a paper airplane that I could throw outside and most paper airplanes are flimsy you know you can't throw up with any force i wanted to be able to i used to be a, a baseball pitcher so i wanted something i could throw hard and and, and have it hold together and climb up into the sky and level off by itself and go into a nice long glide. What I didn't know was, well, that's not really possible. Nothing is going to self-stabilize without some means of control. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know any better. <laughs> <laughs> and I had this very strong visualization, this picture in my mind of this paper airplane doing that. Uh -huh. One day, I folded this plane up and I threw it outside. It climbed up as high as a telephone pole, leveled off, and, in, and went into a beautiful long glide. And I, well, that's what I'm looking for, <laughs> you know. This guy named Floyd Fogelman, he's deceased now. He died some years ago. Mm -hmm. He's a retoucher doing work for me on Volkswagen. <clears throat> I worked on the Volkswagen account. And uh, I said, hey, Floyd, 
come here, let me show you something. I take them out into the hall, and I whip the plane, and it goes sailing down the hall. He goes running after it, and he comes back, and he says, you know, I, I think you've got a whole new concept of neurodynamics here. I said, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he said, well, it doesn't stall. It, it, most airplanes, when they lose lift, you know, they, they reach a, at a 16 degrees angle of attack or whatever, and lift is destroyed and the plane drops mm -hmm. because there's nothing to hold it up. Yep. yep. But that wasn't happening with the paper airplane. The paper airplane simply pitched forward and continued to fly, like what they call porpoising. You know, it would drop, but it would then fly, you know, and continue flying. I see. So, um, for those of you watching, instead of the plane going like, and then as it's as it's um, going down, it's slowing down, It's even though it's going down, it's still the same speed. Well, what, what happens is, uh, it, it just, it retains lift where a normal airfoil doesn't because there's nothing there to hold it up. Mm. Uh, there's a video, uh, I'll send you that video too, of a fella who, uh, using the KFM-4, uh, does this where he tries to stall it, and all it does is just sort of hang in the air and just keep flying. Wow. He won't stall. So, so here's the deal. Uh, I, I say to him, well, um, what, what do you want to do about this? He mm -hmm. says, well, let me take one home and, and, and see if I can translate it to balls of wood and see if it flies with the same characteristics. So I said, go ahead. So I see him a few days later and he's got a big grin on his face so I knew it worked. So now what do we do? Well, we ought to try to file for a patent on it. Exactly. So it took a couple of years and we went through hell because the patent office dropped it. You know, uh, uh, there was some screw up, maybe intentional, I don't know. Yeah. But at any rate, we finally ended up getting the patent. And then um, I wound up on uh, 60 Minutes with Borley Safer doing a, a segment. That was in 1973. And um, that was the night John Ehrlichman was on uh, for Watergate. He was on for 45 minutes and then we came on for 15 minutes wow. after that. Wow. Frank Sinatra singing Come Fly With Me. My favorite song from Sinatra. <laughs> and then they repeated the episode again in 76, right? So at some point, uh, I decided, geez, uh, somebody should write a book about this because this is off the wall, you know? Yeah. So uh, I spoke to a friend of mine who put me in touch with a book, uh, what the hell did I call them? On? My mind's called blank on it. But somebody who was in the, in the book publishing business. Um, and so she set up an appointment with uh, uh, an editor at Simon & Schuster. So we go in, Floyd and I, and uh, the, uh, the lady who was representing us, and uh, we talk about the thing, and the uh, editor says, well, Dick, why don't you write the book? <laughs> now, I, I wasn't expecting this, you know. I thought they would assign a writer, but uh, I said, well, it's a good thing I just bought a IBM Selectric. <laughs> <laughs> So at any rate, I ended up uh, writing the book. And then, <laughs> catch this one, uh, I'm in the uh, Simon & Schuster offices, and this is now 1985, and uh, I, he says to me, um, well, Dick, um, I, you have to come up with a big idea to kick off this book with. And I'm thinking to myself, 
oh my god big ideas don't come along every day yeah <laughs> what the hell am i gonna do you know i said well okay let, let me think about it you know mm-hmm. so on the train ride home i get the big idea i with my little paper airplane would go down to kill devil hills to the site where the wright brothers first flew the first manned flight went 122 feet and i would attempt to beat the distance record of 122 feet with my paper airplane wow well I had never been down there and I had no idea what the hell I was in for there were 25 to 30 mile an hour winds coming in off Cape Hatteras and here I am standing at the rock where the Wright brothers first launched their plane and there's a crew from Good Morning America there to film the whole thing (laughs) and I gotta pull this off (laughs) (laughs) Well, my longest flight was 401 feet, four inches, with a paper airplane. Nice. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you some, some uh, info on that, because mm-hmm. it was written, written up in the magazines. Oh, and by the way, now, an- another lesson learned. Uh, there was a publicity department that uh, Simon and Schuster had hired to uh, publicize uh, this whole event. And one of the things they came up with was a big sign, a, a banner, a big banner that they unfolded. And when they unfolded it, there was uh, a lot of upset by the local people there because the, the banner said Kitty Hawk and the Wright brothers did not fly at Kitty Hawk although that's what's mentioned in the history books mm-hmm. the Wright brothers flew at Kill Devil Hills North Carolina mm-hmm. and the telegram they sent came from Kitty Hawk. So Kitty Hawk got all the publicity and Kill Devil Hills people are kind of upset about it. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) But also it shows you the distortion embedded in history. Nothing is what it appears to be. It's someone's version of what happened, Uh you know? And I thought to myself, isn't that interesting? You know, they can't even get that right. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, at any rate, I went home a happy camper. And uh, the book uh, sold uh, over 124,000 copies, which was pretty good. And, uh, you know, I go into the whole story. This thing with uh, Kitty Hawk, or or with the Kill Devil Hills, rather, wasn't in there because the book had already been published uh, when I was doing this event. But uh, it's been studied in India and and, uh, they've gotten some good results there and also in uh, one of the Arabian countries Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and a number of other places. But yet there's a tremendous amount of resistance it. And the, 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 one, the, the one thing that the airfoil requires is thrust. In other words, the vortex is the most powerful or one of the most powerful forces in the universe. I mean, our whole galaxy, all the galaxies are doing the vortex, right? Mm-hmm. And a uh, tremendous amount of energy there. With this uh, stepped airfoil, it requires thrust to really be, if 
effective. It is not good for glider purposes. Oh. Although you can glide with it, there are pl plenty of people who have who have done gliders with it. But it's just it, the real um, strength of it is in the uh, the fact that you need thrust to trap and hold a vortex, uh, which is also uh, which where the vortex becomes part of the airfoil and. It reduces some of the friction of the air because it's air against air where there's the uh, vortex. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, again, all over the world today in, in radio-controlled aircraft, if you were to go on YouTube, type in KF airfoil or KF M4, uh, airfoil, uh, the KFM-4 has a step on the top and the bottom. It looks like an arrow, and so it traps two vortexes. Mm -hmm. uh, the KFM-3, which is my heavy lifter, I call it that because there are two steps on the upper surface of the airfoil, and they both trap the vortex. But what it also means is that it can lift a lot more weight and there's a video out um done by the uh, uh a couple of guys in uh, missouri where they actually showed that the kfm3 airfoil was able to lift uh 79 ounces versus 71 for a conventional uh, airfoil, uh, wow. but uh, uh, the the one other thing I'd, I'd mention is that my theory is that on a normal airfoil, the first half of the airfoil does all the lifting, not the second half, because the 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 uh, curvature of the upper surface. Uh, diminishes after the 50% mark roughly and and so the uh, uh, air pressure is reduced over the upper surface in that area and that's where you get lift whereas on the KFM 3 airfoil the entire airfoil or most of the entire airfoil is lifting because of the vortexes See, the vortexes are rotating at a faster rate than the air molecules underneath, so there's less pressure across the whole upper surface. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. But I stumbled into this. I, it was quite, you know, quite by accident. I had no training or knowledge of aerodynamics. What? So ever, but I had a vision in my mind, and I wanted to make this thing happen. And uh, I would say all uh, inventions begin with a question, uh, and that goes back to that poster I did of uh, Einstein riding a beam of light. He asked himself a question, you know, what? would happen if I were to ride a beam of light, you know? And just intuitively, he listened to the answer he got from his brain. Uh, and and it, it's all about asking a question. And uh, if your intention is strong enough, you will somehow source a solution mm -hmm. to your question. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it also, now, now this is going to sound crazy, but for just for the fun of it, <laughs> <laughs> just for the fun of it, I used to spend, when I was working in the city, and I still do it today, I will picture finding a dime somewhere. Uh, I visualize the dime. And when I used to go to work, I'd, I'd find dimes in elevators, near phone booths, parking meters, you name it. 
uh, I, I cannot tell you how many dimes I sourced. <laughs> and I do it to this day. I, I'm, I'm, I'm still doing it. You know, you always have to be willing to stay with what you got because that's what is. But you put the intention out and I, 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 I keep visualizing dimes and I keep finding them. <laughs> <laughs> Try it, you'll like it. <laughs> cool, I will. I mean, you know, if you're thinking of dimes, you're going to be more apt to notice them too. A lot of times our eyes see, but our brain doesn't process it all. So what you focus yeah. on will help you notice things. For example, yeah. a lot of driver safety courses in the past didn't teach people to watch out for motorcyclists and bicyclists. So all these cars would actually, the drivers would not see the motorcyclists because they were trained just to look out for other cars. We literally, right. we are eyes would see it and hit our retina and go into our brain and our brain would ignore it. You, you know where, that, where else that turned up? Mm, tell me. From what I've... When Columbus and these other people came from Spain, the Indians never saw the ships because they had no frame of reference for them. Wow. How? So the Indians, they didn't see the big ships. They only saw the small canoes. Well, well, they, what they when the, when these people landed, they saw them. But but it's just that the the ships didn't register you know, because it it wasn't part of their frame of reference. Wow. Wow. Yeah. At least that's the way I've understood it, you know, because I was like, wow, too, when I first heard that. Uh, but then it all makes sense, you know, if it's something you've never, you can't be prepared for it, like you can't be prepared for the bicycle if you don't expect to see one, or if you've never seen one, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. No. So, at any rate, um, Oh, hey, uh, now do you want to give me your email address? Yeah, um, I, I, what I'll do is I'll reply to your message on um, the message you left. In fact, I can actually do it right now. I'll, um, I'll log into my YouTube. I'll reply to that message. That way you have it so you can send me all these things. Okay, and also uh, put your phone number in there too. Mm-hmm. I'll, um, I'll, I will, um, let me just, um, find your, find it right now. Uh, wow, I got a lot of comments that I didn't see. Um, but I, again, I, I really appreciate you, um, talking to me. This is so cool. You know, you're the first inventor I've talked to, so. Are you getting comments now from people on this? Um, not on this because I haven't put this oh. up yet, but on my other oh, videos. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, listen, I, I'm glad I had a chance to to share this with you, and I I think from this day forward, you're gonna view things a little differently <laughs> in terms of relationship. But I also uh, want to make uh, oh, there's there's one other. Are you interested in one more theory? Absolutely, please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I live by this one, by the way. Cool. Um, I'm excited to hear I, it. Okay. I call it uh, my no spin theory. Uh huh. Okay, and it, and it goes like this We are all creatures of survival and self preservation. As a result, uh, events that are coming toward us, we tend to put our own spin on what we think it means and what the outcome means. And it can be either positive or negative. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, both are a big 
waste of time. Okay. Um, uh, for, for an example, uh, when uh, I talk to people who get stressed out uh, because of some impending event, <laughs> I say to them, all right, look, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a list of every possibility that you think will occur. And I bet you that more than likely what will happen is not on your list. Yes, very true. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Because none of us can beat the script writer of life. It's quantum mechanics at work. It's like there's so many possibilities and we're hemmed in by only our prior input and therefore we cannot imagine something outside of that. Yep. yep. Now conversely, something can happen like, I want the lottery! Yay! You know, three years later you're filing for bankruptcy. Yep, and that happens a lot to lottery winners. <laughs> right, right. But the point I'm making is all that positive spin was a big waste of time. So none of us know what anything really means until the event has passed and we've had a chance to evaluate it. And very often, we learn more from negative experiences than we do from positive ones. Yep. We need both. We need both, but you learn much more from negative experiences. It's go like going to college. You know, it's like you need to do it. You need to get the lesson, and the trick then is not to lose the lesson. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, as I say, put no spin on anything. Because you only fool yourself, you know. It's an all point of job I always wanted. And then you're inside and all of a sudden, this is like hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, the thing is, we don't know what any of it means. And, and all you can do is play with it as it unfolds and uh, you know make the best of it and learn from it and move forward you know yeah at source and always we're forms of energy so keep sourcing what you really want see it happening in your mind yeah yeah wow that's and that's powerful it's another way of of what you know many many people say live in the present and it's yeah. it's it's a, another way of interpreting it but i love your way of applying quantum mechanics and all that well yeah because that's that's what quantum mechanics is all about exactly. you know it's like but but it, it's the antithesis of what science is all about yeah. which is making a measurement you got to make a measurement because if you make a measurement you could then predict you know, an outcome, <laughs> but not with quantum mechanics. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, uh, well, listen, I, I hope that uh, you've uh, enjoyed this uh, little chat. <laughs> Absolutely. This was a great deep conversation. So um, I think next step, once I, I gave you my email already on um, YouTube, so just um, send me any pictures or anything you want to include in this. And then um, I'll just, you know, since I'll have your email, I'll, I'll let you know when I put this up. And um, I don't know if you have any interest coming back for the future, but I'd love to talk to you again if you have any interest. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, I, I, I would. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, my, my fans, my audience would love to hear your voice too because, you know, I, one of my goals this year, as in 2017, is to, is to bring in as many people who want to share their voices as possible. I do love interviewing people. I used to be a journalist, so the interviewing people comes natural to me. And I want, I want my channel, you know, I like vlogging, like talking, but 
it's, it's not always every day that I have something meaningful to say. So I want to crowdsource it. I want anyone who wants to talk to me on camera and share their voice with anyone who wants to hear to talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, actually, see, for, for you, it's paid off in terms of this conversation because um, because you're a very open person, you're you're curious about things, and uh, you're you're uh, uh, just very very uh, genuine. Oh, thank you. Well, you are. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, and that's what made me say, "Gee, let me let me contact this guy and, and give him my thoughts on." Uh, uh, game theory, <laughs> you know, because because uh, to me, game that game theory is it's uh, you're still at the front door, <laughs> and reality is inside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're thinking tactics, but you're not thinking the ground that people are walking on that's causing them to think this way. Yeah, and you're you're bringing it to the deep. You're like, no, it's you know you can't just think about the topics. You have to think about why they think about the tactics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, well, when I, I send you this list, I'd be interested in uh, your uh, thoughts on it. Mm -hmm. um, but but what I what I try to do is is cover as many uh, uh, possibilities in terms of w why a relationship is working or it's not working, you know? And, um, you know, as I say, I, I, I mentioned uh, at one point in my emails to you uh, that, um, not my emails, but the uh, YouTube thing, that uh, I, I have a theory as to why the divorce rate is so high. And, and basically, it's what we've been talking about, is that when you're little and you have a bad connection with the prototype, with the original, what you do when you grow up is you try to recreate that scenario in an attempt to fix things. Yeah. And it doesn't work. Yeah, it does not work. Because you're not the same person, they're the they're not the same person. You you'll never be able to replicate your childhood situation. And even if you did, the way the universe works, it'll turn out differently every time. You know, if we apply your quantum right. mechanics to it. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. So um, the thing is, I, I think uh, you'll have a, a whole different perspective now. On Things and, and you, you're seeing how all these relationships you had were all built on on quicksand. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, but but at least to know that and to understand that you're now in a position to choose something different. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I tell you, Jerry, if you can find someone that you truly love and build a life with it is priceless because no amount of money in the world can buy it it ain't for sale you know so it's it's very important to uh, realize that it is possible but you gotta understand how the puzzle fits together and unfortunately, I'm just speaking for modern society, the puzzle's gotten a little more complicated. It's, you know, because we have social media, the world is so connected now. So um, for everyone watching my channel, um, it is, it is and part of what, why they like my channel is I just genuinely express sort of like the, the frustrations a lot of people have. And right. it, it was a it was a much simpler time. Even when my parents went to college, like all the all the students in college ended up like marrying each other because you know they didn't they didn't have social media to be like oh yeah I can um, date someone another province away. So community back then really helped you find someone. But now communities are broken. You really don't yeah. know your neighbors. Even in China, it's becoming that point you know there's cities are all the size in New York City but do you think those neighbors really know each other anymore in China is like becoming a 
as American, if not more American, with regards to the lack of community. Right, right. Well, um, yeah, unfortunately, um, uh, the, the world has, has, has really gotten turned upside down in many ways. But, uh, oh, but there was one other uh, uh, piece of wisdom I wanted to pass along. Sure. And that is almost everybody comes with baggage. The trick is to not carry someone else's baggage. Uh huh. You know, because in a sense, you have done that in the past, right? Yeah. You know, the, the wounded birds that you've gotten involved with, you've picked up their baggage. No, when I when I feel myself picking up their baggage, I'm like, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill myself. I'm I'm gone. That's what happens. Right. <laughs> right. Like that. So I protect that, myself. You know, I'm rational, smart enough that I can see when that baggage is is coming right my way, and I'm running. I run the other like, way and like focus that, on myself. Like that woman, like that woman who uh, forced her way into your. Uh, of, of, parents house oh my like, god like, yeah showed up at my door randomly <laughs> <laughs> but see that's trouble that that kind of person is trouble uh -huh. and you keep there and they're users and that's yeah. the other thing too you know you've got to watch out for the users and unfortunately it's becoming more and more in society because we have two opposing forces right we have the female nature which wants to be taken care of but then they're also taught oh yeah you have to be strong and independent there's like two conflicting things so it's like the natural thing is just to try to place the blame on sort of other things including men you know so Right. The, yeah. And it's it's I don't know which wave of feminism started it, but you know I'm gonna just be out there and say feminism has really made it hard for men who want to sort of be more independent, want to do their own thing, and not put up with bullshit. Yeah. It's made it hard for men like us to really find quote unquote a unicorn or someone special. Right. Right. But look. But look. Here's the thing now too. Mm -hmm. um, First of all, you're coming from your prior frame of reference, okay? Uh -huh. And it's in, there are some good and decent people out there in the world. They're like gems, though. You gotta search for them. Um, the, the thing is, that um, uh, you, you have to uh, recognize that, you know, most people can be a bag of trouble, but, but there are good people out there, and you uh, have to find a way to put yourself where they are, in a sense, a library, uh, a, a musical group, I don't know, you know, it's hard to say, but, but if your intention is there, and I know it's there, um, you can make it happen, you can make it happen, it's just, uh, you get rid of that other agenda that you had, and, and, and you're going to be picking completely differently. You know, oh, and again, the, the, the number one thing, the level of self-esteem. If it's low, run like hell. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But also the other thing, and this is the hard one, in terms of the past now, you were picking them because your level of self-esteem was low. Mm -hmm. That's the tough one to own it and yeah. to say, okay, time to build, time to build it. Yeah. You follow? You follow? Yeah. No, that's that's um, it's a it's a brilliant point. I mean, it is. Because the, the, if you get to a ten, you're going to pick a ten. Yeah. 
And, and listen, Jerry, feel free to call me or contact me anytime you want. Any questions, if I can answer them, I'd be happy to. Uh, just feel free. Sure. Um, I have one last question. I think a lot of my fans would be um, very interested in this, too. Um, how are your kids doing? Are they grown up? With Do you have grandkids already? What What did your kids end up doing? Did they follow in your path, join the military? Well, um, I, I, I had a, a very uh, unusual situation that I had to deal with, and it's very complicated. It is unbelievably complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a son and a daughter. Uh, I had uh, a, a, their stepfather uh, was an assassin what? of character, of people's character. See, I knew him uh, for a number of years before uh, uh, he ran off with my ex, mm -hmm. okay. and um, it, it's a very long story. I'll just skim over the surface of it, but he was uh, in Auschwitz and Dachau as a prisoner of, of the Nazis. He lost his father there. He and his mother finally uh, were released and came to this country. He was a, a piano teacher and um, by profession, and he would invite uh, people that he knew over to play at his house before they would go to play at Carnegie Hall. And after the evening ended and everybody left, he would ask me in his heavy Polish accent, so tell me, Dick, what did you think of his playing? And I don't know anything about music. You know? I, said, well, I, I don't know. I, I, it sounded like an avalanche of notes. Nice. That's correct. And then, then he would slice and dice the guy. But he would do that with everybody. He uh -huh. was an invalidator. My old boss in one of the agencies I worked for was also that way. Uh, a, a, a real invalidator. Uh -huh. you know, they, the only way they can elevate themselves is to invalidate others. Oh, those so, people, so, man. Ugh. <laughs> yeah. So he turned my kids against me. Oh my and, god. Uh, yeah, but you know something? Mm -hmm. That was but, but but what happened was after 10 years, uh uh my my son came back to me and and uh, now, you know, we've been uh, close for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. I, uh, but I have no contact with my daughter because she. Ch he wanted. He wanted them to uh, uh, officially be adopt them and take on his name. You know, uh, and my son refused. My my daughter didn't. And but you know, the, one of the things I've learned in life is. Blood is not thicker than water. If someone in your own family turns on you or does something that we say, we're done, it's over, goodbye. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, then, exactly. It, and you know, it's okay because I will not put up with bullshit. I Good. will not put up with being used. I will not put up with being jerked around. And my daughter jerked me around plenty uh, when she was uh, little. And, 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 and my son, was uh, he had his issues, but we got over them. And he went into the Air Force. He grew up, and he came back, and, and we've been together, and it's been fine. So win one, lose one. But it's okay, you know, because you make your own life. And uh, I've lived for 43 years now uh, with uh, my wife, and, and I have never been more happy in my entire life, you know. So it was a win-win for me. Yeah, I bet. You know? But, um, you know, there are plenty of, children who take their parents to the cleaner, you know, with drug addiction or 
whatever, you know. And they go along with it, the parent. Parents have no defense against a nasty child, you know. They really don't. Uh, but I think you got to defend yourself no matter what. You, you, you cannot allow yourself to be taken down. Exactly. Like other yeah. Idiot, you yeah. know. But uh, at any rate, uh, so it, it's all worked out very well. I wouldn't change a note and, and the knowledge I've gained, because I was, ever since I was a kid, I was always hungry for answers. What the hell is this insanity all about? You know, it's like we live in an open and insane asylum in the world, you know, the way people behave and treat each other, you know, and, uh, and yet there are good people out there. You know, there are a lot of hardworking, good people out there. So um, I always try to acknowledge them, you know, uh, like if a clerk goes out of his way to do something for me in a story, you know what I say to him? You know something? You add to the quality of life. If you weren't here, I wouldn't get the kind of service I'm getting. Thank you. Nice. And the smile I get, uh, or a cashier, I say, you know, you have a very nice smile. And then they smile twice as much. Oh, and I say, oh. like that. I say, the sun just came out. Yeah. And they smile. <laughs> you know, because nobody notices these people. And I call them by name, to, if they have a name tag. I mean, they're human beings, and they're contributing to society by being there and servicing you, you know? So why shouldn't you acknowledge them? And everybody wants to be acknowledged, but they're really not willing to give it to other people. Yeah. <laughs> you know? So, <coughs> at any rate, that's uh, my, my approach mm -hmm. to life, you know? And, and again, it's, a lot of it has to do too with with karma, you know, if you put out good karma, more than likely you'll get good karma back. Yeah, absolutely. If you put out bad karma, guess what you get back? <laughs> yeah. So the choice is yours, you know. But again, if, if people have a lot of misplaced anger uh, or they've got a lot of stuff going on and uh, they're, they, they feel they've been victimized and and now they're angry or whatever it is, you know, they pass that along to people and then guess what? They, they get treated the same way. <laughs> Why? <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it all starts with uh, introspection and asking questions yep. you know, of yourself and trying to connect the dots, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, at any rate, um, I've enjoyed chatting with you, Jerry, and uh, you're a terrific guy. How do you pronounce your last name? Leo. Leo. Uh, say that again. Leo. Leo. Uh, I am Rio. Yeah, with an L. Leo. Leo. Oh, Leo. Yeah, Leo. Leo. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, at any rate, Jerry, uh, you're, you're doing a terrific job. And you're very uh, open and, and uh, no bullshit and curious and uh, that's great, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't wait to send you the Einstein picture. Yeah, absolutely. I want to see it. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, there's one more I'll send you yeah, of please. Einstein. I have Einstein. Uh, uh, you, know, you know what a GIF file is, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, I did a GIF file of Einstein standing on a beach and dice are falling out of the sky because he once said that he didn't think God played dice with the universe. That's right. And That's right. I don't agree. <laughs> I think, he, I think he, <laughs> the whole thing is a crapshoot. But at any rate, I, so I did this little uh, animation thing of uh, Einstein watching dice drop out of the sky. <laughs> 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 but 
At any rate, uh, I'll let you go. Yeah. And um, so, um, so for everyone watching, um, if you want Dick back, please let us know in the comments. And again, Dick, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure. I, I enjoyed it too, because it's nice to be able to share stuff with what you've learned. You get your head bloodied learning your lessons, but uh, if you can share it with other people and if it helps them, it's all, it's all worth it. <laughs> exactly. And sharing and teaching helps you learn it better too. That's one of the secrets oh, of oh, learning yeah. things better. Yes, yes. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. yeah. And that's part of the reason why I teach math on my channel. It's not that I was bad at math, I just hated math because I didn't get it as quick as some of my peers. But now it's like I realize I was just doing it wrong. And so it's like I'm just teaching people now because I want to eventually go back, you know, get a statistics master's or something or get a data science degree. So this is my start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, see it coming together in your mind. Mm -hmm. Project yourself forward. You know, yeah, just to give you another little illustration, you know, if if my wife and I are going on a trip, say going up to Maine or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to be on the highway for hours and shit happens, right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I always, I picture myself and her getting there, I see us there, and then I see us returning home, you know. So it's like placing yourself into the future. Now maybe it'll do nothing, who the hell knows. But it can't hide. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. Awesome. We'll yeah, we'll talk some more soon, man. Um, correspond via email with me and I will definitely bring you back in the future. So I thanks again. Thank you again, Dick. Okay, and, and listen, any mm -hmm. thoughts, anything you wanna ask, email me or whatever. Feel free to do it, and if I can give you my, my take on it, I'll do it. Sure.